been sent an agent to, to spy on them, and <laughs> and that was all very sad because in the end that's why Wordsworth lease he couldn't stay at at Al Fox and nearby in Holford, and and they had to go. And but the thing is, I suppose you've got to think at the time. It's a bit like Glastonbury Festival, something like the rock stars suddenly converged on a, a village today. You know, you had you had know, you had work Harvey Coleridge and Wordsworth, Robert Southey. Um, you know, a, a very, very young Shelley, no doubt, who was very influenced because Coleridge used to read Ancient Mariner to Mary Shelley when she was a little girl and she, she quotes from it in Frankenstein. And So all these great individuals were sort of converging on the area um, at one time. You know, uh, Humphrey Davy, who, who discovered laughing gas, and, you know, all these were, they were all, you know. So when you guys moved from London to the West Country, yeah. did you go to Netherstone specifically? Or? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I I live in between. I live in in a little place called Binkham, which is technically over Stowey. Um, but I kind of feel closer to Nether Stowey, probably because of the cold yeah, well, And I'm nice. technically, I suppose, w- w- walk-wise closer. But over Stowey's got some very interesting history, too, because of um, Reverend Holland, who wrote a diary um, that uh, called Porpoise and Pig Killers, which thinks uh, being on the radio. I think wow. the BBC did that. So there's lots of fascinating history where I live, really. And... It- I don't mind asking you, because you're that young, you shouldn't really care. How old are you, Ben? Uh, I'm, uh, how old am I? I'm crimes. Uh, 39 now. <laughs> yeah. So Forget. all this knowledge and experience, and, and still only uh, 39. But when you were 35, yeah. something happened to you, didn't it? Oh, yes, yes, the heart attack, yeah. Yeah, I just just got off a plane not long before, so I was happy it didn't happen <laughs> while I was up up above the Atlantic Ocean. Because because of that, um, you mentioned about architecture. Um, I got to work on some amazing events, um, but they were also very quite stressful because yeah. a lot of them are very sort of sales-based jobs. And uh, there's not much support in that field. You can meet some great people, but it's a very sort of bullish... Um, I don't know what to call it really, um, macho kind of, I don't know, it can be a bit backstabbing and mm. it was very sort of stressful at the same time but I also got to meet some amazing people like Eric Lloyd Wright who was Frank Lloyd Wright's son um, and so that was, I, mean, I had about six trips in a year to America, I'd never even been on a plane before 1994, you know, so, uh, sorry 2004. So yeah and then um, about two two days ago, four years ago uh, to the day I had, uh, had a heart attack luckily I was at home um, would you believe in Stowey mm. and, um, and I thought I had indigestion and uh, took some uh, Rennie but it didn't work um, and, uh, <laughs> and the, the ambulance got called and I just sort of laughed my way through it really but it was it wasn't nice I had angiogram and everything which they sort of tell you oh, 40% of people uh, die or have a stroke um, if you have this and so I'm saying my last goodbyes last you know <laughs> it's quite you know but you're um, okay now oh yeah yeah I think well I hope so you know and your, your, your lifestyle's changed yeah, um, a yeah. lot and that's helped but as a result of this you now volunteer for the British Heart Foundation as much as I can yeah why yeah. is it important for you to do that well simply simply to you know keep raising the money i mean they've got um what's it called healing hearts i think or mending help mending hearts um, campaign at the moment which um is to do with raising funds for you know because a lot of the research now and a lot of the drugs they're discovering or, or mm. you know which tend to be sort of discovered in nature anyway and then they replicate it i suppose in the laboratories and that's how it all seems to work um a lot of that sort of research wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for for the british heart foundation so i just try and do what i can really what are you going to be doing today for them well i'm, I'm collecting uh, i've got to be there at 11 o'clock actually <laughs> at the orchard shopping center so if in you see, see a bloke yeah, yeah if you see a bloke you know um, in a, you know, with, with the old British Heart Foundation, that, that's me. So and, and go, go and see him. Go and yeah. see him. Right, we must talk about the book, the Vril Codex. Now, yeah, yeah. in in my opinion, and I'm a bit soft when it comes to reading, um, right. it does appear quite dark. Yeah, Can yeah. you summarise the storyline mm-hmm. for us? Well, basically, it's um, it's kind of a romantic gothic thriller. So it's it's based for probably people from about 16, 17 upwards. But, I mean, youngsters could read it too, but it's not a graphic novel. I mean, the, the whole point I wrote it was, was because there's never been a novel written uh, about Vril and the Nazis. Um, and explain Vril. Well, Vril um, is an ancient Norse kind of um, Nordic pagan belief in a, in a kind of subterranean power that people can summon up. Uh, it's a bit Dennis Wheatley, I know, but it's kind of um, for good or bad, but they would believe good 
but of course, like everything, the Nazis corrupted it. But the, there's a lot of conspiracy theories. I mean, when I was visiting libraries and researching the book, you know, I found um, a number of sort of historians books about it as stated as fact that they you know that there was a, a society all based around this thrill and then i found recently to my astonishment there's a a cult in america actually a thrill cult in america, really? and they deny that, that there was any involvement ever of, of hitler and the nazis so it's, it's a it's a contentious subject but the actual storyline is is a, is a romantic one in a sense because it's a love story too it's a sort of supernatural love story the main heroines the main figures actually are female in the in the novel. Um, firstly, the the, the heroine. Uh, I don't want to give the plot away, but also the baddie, um, Helena Hister, is is uh, cracking. She's but she's uh, she's the baddie. Um, and uh, the chap in the novel is is a bit confused, and he's uh, he kind of goes in search of of trying to find out about this legend and and what what's happened to his wife and, and everything else. Um, and uh, there's a sort of psychic archaeologist in it called Warwick Blake, who's a sort of gnarled old um, sort of tweed trouser wearing, uh, <laughs> uh, you know. So it's it's the characters are quite. I tried to make them fun and and appealing to to everybody, men and women, really. So it does have a strong sort of romantic streak in that. And it's um, and so that you're selling it to me because you, you hit my button with the romance type thing. Um, what oh, kind yeah. of reaction have you had to it so far? Well, I mean, I've, I've, because, well, we live in, I suppose, because everything's, you know, years ago, I suppose you'd have travelled around to book fairs and, and you, you'd have, uh, you know, I mean, you look at someone like, um, I don't know, a book like Celestine Prophecy, I mean, he, he uh, couldn't get, get that published at all. He self-published, vanity published, whatever, um, and in the end he ended up being picked up by a publisher because it was doing so well and, and he ended up with 22 million sales, you know, mm. incredible. Um, but, uh, no, I've, I've been going mainly through the internet, I suppose that's the way things have gone. Much rather would be meeting people and having discussions about the novel direct. I have a few people. I mean, there's a lady called Ruth Riggs, who I met at uh, Coleridge Cottage, who, when I was getting, you know, the fabled Stephen King-type rejections, because he mm -hmm. used to say that every rejection he got, he used to think that's a plus point, because I'm obviously doing something right, because I don't <laughs> like it. So, And he had about, he had hundreds of them. So, But when I had my doubts about it, she was really great. And, uh, and also an Ohio artist called Marnell Cromwell, who, who actually told me about the publisher that I'm with. Um, she gave me great feedback. I've got a Twitter thing and a Facebook. The Facebook thing's been the main uh, bit of fun with it. You have to be careful the way you use Facebook for these sorts of things. Yeah. But I've got, had about 100 people who, who like it on there. And so. it's part of a series, isn't it? Well, hopefully. I mean, a lot of that depends on... Because writing, you know, um, takes a lot of time, particularly if you're dyslexic. <laughs> um, so... You know, it, it really depends how it does, you know, uh, and how it performs as well. I mean, getting it in the shops, obviously with the online thing, you know, people can get it, like, get it that way. Um, I've got a blog um, called frillcodex.blogspot.com. Um, just leave out the WWs. And if you go to that, you can see where you, you can obtain it. In terms of getting into bookshops... I mean, my pub, the publisher I'm with, um, people might not be aware of 